For those of you who don't know, my name is Catherine Wu. I work for Masari, we're a New York-based company um, that, you know, our mission is to sort of provide more transparency into the crypto asset uh, industry. Um, and, you know, I am a U.S. lawyer by training. Um, I don't practice law, but I do spend a lot of time thinking about the intersection between uh, law and technology and also politics. Um, so this is an issue that's pretty uh, near and dear to my heart. So, um, yeah, so without further ado, you know, I'm here today to discuss discuss a topic really that I think would be a little hard to cover in the next 20 minutes, but is, you know, nonetheless relevant to a lot of the discussions that's been happening both at DevCon and also in the broader crypto um, ecosystem thus far. So, you know, let's uh, start with a question. Okay, as we think about the future of the crypto space, about Web3, about crypto's impact on society, I think sometimes it helps to bring the discussion back to basics and think about um, two questions, which is, you know, what is, what is it about the current state of the world and its governance structure do we want to change? Um, and secondly, does it need to be changed? Mm -hmm. So my goal, of course, is not to present an answer to the above questions, but to develop a framework and hopefully provide a little bit more nuance into this context that I think can be quite um, polarizing at times, especially online, uh, on Twitter, and other forums. So with that, here's where I want to kick off the discussion, which is you know, to look at the history, the formation, and the evolution of public international law. So international law consists of the framework and infrastructure in which the foreign affairs of states are conducted. So that includes the institutions, forms, and procedures for daily activity, uh, the assumptions on which the society, our society is founded, um, concepts which permeate through those societies, and the various relations between the society's individual members. And the infrastructure for um, all of those agreed upon assumptions and practices, uh, commitments, expectations, and reliance is all kind of under the umbrella of international law. And this is important, uh, I think, to crypto because you know the crypto community is also a global community. And I think there are some parallels you can draw between nation states and also various, uh, various actors um, in the space. So you know, I'm glad I actually went after Santiago because I loved the discussion that he provided, uh, specifically some of the context that I want to start with, which, you know, when we think about the 30-year war and what ended it, right, the Treaty of uh, Westphalia, um, two important things resulted from that uh, treaty, which he went to um, a little bit earlier. But, you know, first, it's the birth of the modern state from an international relations perspective. Um, so it became clear that the primary origin of international discourse was the nation state. And um, the nation state was also defined in a critical way, which is, you know, that the state is sovereign. So, you know, what happens in the border of the state um, is subject to the control of that state and that state only. And secondly, it gave rise to the notion of the sovereign equality of the states. So this means that in theory, um, no matter the realities of economic disparity, um, that in the eyes of the law, all states are considered or understood to be equal. So no state has greater power to sit in judgment over another. So this treaty created sovereign states in theory. Um, and from there on out, customary law, which is the practice that's reinforced both through um, actual practice um, and common understanding of the international community, developed very fast. So, you know, customary law is sort of one way in which international law derives its authority from. Um, but of course, the question, of course, is, you know, how exactly does international law um, on a global scale even gets enforced? So there are two ways, generally speaking, when it comes to enforcement mechanisms. So the first, um, enforcement mechanisms are pretty clear cut when it's considered to be vertical. So if you take the US for example, right? So US Congress can impose a rule or, or a law or regulation that says insider trading is illegal. So once they impose that, the law is then reinforced by the relevant government regulators like the SEC and DOJ, which we heard plenty about. So, you know, they have harsh penalties for non-compliance. And as a result, the individual traders have an incentive to comply with the law um, and avoid the sort of risks associated with trading based on material and non-public information. Of course, the challenge arises when um, governance is horizontal. So, for example, though we have the framework for international human rights law, human rights violations persist around the world. Um, we continue to see gross violations and disregard for basic human rights that are being perpetrated by individuals, by governments, and by international organizations. 
So here we're faced with the biggest challenge in international law, which is that it's not real, or rather, how does it get reinforced um, or enforced? International law does not have like a central lawmaker, right? Um, because we don't have a world police force or a world government. And so there's no mandatory vertical governance in this instance. Um, so, you know, there are some scholars out there who, th who are very, very skeptical about international law, and they think that, you know, the reason why international law doesn't work um, is because there's an absence of a comprehensive judicial system with compulsory jurisdiction to settle these disputes, and the absence of a central executive to enforce compliance with judicial system decisions. And I actually disagree with that. You know, I think that the emphasis on global courts or a global police force is quite misleading. In fact, you know, when you look at the reality of it, international law derives its binding force from sources other than courts, other than police forces. Um, states comply with international law out of um, a number of reasons, but a strong one is out of this expectation of reciprocity or retaliation if they don't comply, or generally out of a belief that a law is morally legitimate um, and therefore ought to be obeyed. And so, for example, you know, effective sanctions exist without the need for centralized adjudication or enforcement agencies. But you know, mostly I want to um, uh, point to the formation of customary international law, which is, like I said earlier, the practice of, um, you know, this is a practice that's reinforced both through a consistent practice and B, common understanding of the international community, um, which remains a highly effective one. So for the record, I'm not addressing like other sources of international law, like, uh, like treaties, which are kind of more like contracts or written agreements, um, but rather customary international law are formed from a general and consistent practice of states that is followed by states out of a sense of obligation. So thinking like what the right thing to do is. Um, and that sense of obligation is called opinio juros in like legal terms. Um, so examples of that that uh, include diplomatic immunity, um, right? It's agreement and it's consensus among members and states first, um, and then the establishment of governing laws second. So, you know, I think a lot of people typically assume that the only binding force or rules are made by uh, legislative and, and courts. And we tend to forget that, honestly, you know, law can also be made by a consent um, that comes from a community of people without any formal enactment by government entities. And in fact, you know, such customs or practices are not even written down sometimes. So, you know, as an example, we can think of like industry practices, right? Like, let's take this out of the nation state for a minute and let's think about sports and, and general like like sportsmanship. Um, there was a couple years ago, um, so when we were t talking about like US football, um, I'm not gonna name the team, but you know, there was one US team that was kind of going around and like recording other teams and their practices. Um, which is uh, not a rule. There's no rule like by the NFL that says you can't do that. Um, but it's generally understood that you shouldn't do that because it's not the right thing to do. Um, of course, you know, after they started doing that, I think eventually the NFL then imposed, you know, kind of made that like, a, okay, you can't do this to another team. Um, but you know, like to bring that back to, you know, that's sort of accepted that you don't do this and. And, and teams traditionally have not done this. And because of this behavior and that's consistent, um, it then gets codified later on. And so, you know, like going back to international law, like ultimately customary international law is a signal source of both strength and flexibility for, for international law. And it allows international actors to develop rules for behavior um, that are sort of informally without the need to resort to a formal lawmaking with a central, a lawmaker with a central body. So what's an example of a consistent practice and common understanding from the community that we can bring in a, the crypto space? Well, I think first we need standards. Um, so, you know, there's something that I read one time which emphasizes the importance of values. Um, so, you know, it's possible or it might be possible for two equally effective governance systems to complete uh, to compete by internalizing different values. Um, so, you know, one could perhaps embrace diversity and openness at the cost of some efficiency. Um, and the other could be optimized for efficiency, but for a more sort of like homogeneous set of users and interests. So whether, you know, it's the crypto industry working out a global taxonomy that makes sense or standardizing the very sort of minimal amount of disclosures uh, that should be demanded from token projects, whether it's before or during or after the token sale, it's, it's about figuring out the values that the community agrees on and pushing those forward. You know, so bringing this back to the earlier criticisms um, of international law 
you know, personally, I think the critics are asking the wrong questions at the end. You know, what matters is not whether international law has the exact same legislative, judicial, and executive branches that domestic states do internally. What matters is whether international law is reflected in the behavior of the states. So, you know, it's not whether or not there's a formal judiciary. Instead, it's whether disputes are resolved in an orderly, peaceful fashion in accordance with international law, which they mostly are. And more importantly, it's not whether about, you know, if the law is enforceable or not. The question is whether or not it's de facto being observed and whether it influences the behavior of the states. So nations have generally accepted important limitations on their sovereignty, um, and the result is substantial order that we live in today. It's not perfect, it's not optimal, but it's substantial, and it's and it's you know um, it works well enough for you and I to be here today and like you know just have the day to day work out fine. Um, and so you know in reality, I think the actual international system is a hybrid of two theories. One, norms that are formed by treaty, and two, by consent. And so therefore, the actual international system is a compromise point between those two theories. Now, over the kind of, you know, just being online over the past, uh, you know, year and a half being crypto, I overhear conversations that often go something like this. We don't give a damn about governments and their laws because we're building Web3. Um, so to me, I think that's sort of a misunderstanding of what we're really striving to work towards. You know, what we're trying to work towards in this space specifically, it's, you know, we're trying to empower sovereign equality in individuals. It's about creative incentives for human cooperation, and it's about creating good citizenship among the global community. Ultimately, governance is a bottom-up approach. Goals and value go hand in hand, but are created from ongoing community consensus more than predefined rules. And you know, technology may ultimately move the discussion uh, forward and give us a framework to build upon, but governance is not a ground zero issue. And at the end of the day, it's about human behavior. And that's it, thanks guys. You can find me, that's my Twitter, and for Masari. All righty. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Um, we have time for one or two questions. Does anybody have a question? Looking, looking, looking. Again, I have... Oh. Hey, Catherine. Thanks for the awesome talk. Uh, it just struck me a moment ago as you were describing international law um, that there are some parallels with, uh, sorry, sorry if this is way out there, but like the way that different blockchains are governed, mm -hmm. right? And like systems like Polkadot that are being built that are saying, hey, each chain can go off and do its own thing and can have its own rules, its own governance on chain, but then there's some sort of central system where they coordinate and there's some higher level where they can communicate and some level of invariance. I'm just wondering if you've ever thought about that and if there's anything we can learn from international law in building these systems. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately what I'm trying to say here is just sort of like when we're looking to rebuild any sort of governance systems, um, let's not totally disregard history, right? And so, you know, and I wanted to mention this earlier today, didn't have the quite time to get to it, but if you look at the UN, for example, I think the UN is a good example of a body of, or, you know, 200 plus countries has come together, voluntarily signed an agreement, and that's fantastic in theory. But when you really look at, like, for example, the UN Security Council, that's ultimately five members that decide everything, right? And that... So the UN is a member, you know, it's supposed to be like 200 equal members together, but then you have five who centralize all of the power. Um, and so that's an example of a centralized uh, decision-making body that maybe isn't for the best interest of people because we all know how gridlocked it can get. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but. So like uh, going back to what you were describing on, I guess, like horizontal versus vertical, would you say that... Um, Currently, like customary international law is like very or somewhat similar to how like uh, self-regulating like uh, like SROs work in that um, there's like a body of um, institutions or businesses or what have you that basically just kind of like make sure that for the sake of like not having to like bring in like some vertical like watchdog, they kind of just kind of like police one another and make sure that that there aren't like bad actors. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, I think ultimately like. The point I bring up with customary international law is that it's very like dialogue focused and it's very sort of like you put out the standards among yourselves first 
and then that gets codified, right? So when you're thinking about like, how do you regulate the crypto industry? Like, how does that even start with? Let's start with, like I said earlier, standards, right? Like what, um, so for example, uh, Masari is part of this initiative called the Digi uh, Global Digital Finance. And we had a huge debate recently over what does it even mean to be an investor, right? Are you talking about investor, people who are using or buying tokens for speculative use? Are you talking about people who are using this? Are you talking about, I mean, could miners technically be a user? I mean, it's just, there's so, it's like very convoluted and like as an industry, we can't even agree on like what these different standards are, or like what best practices are. Um, that gets hard for ultimately everyone to like want to follow the same set of rules because uh, definitions are all different. So, you know, tying it back to um, like dialogue and con conversations and community uh, consensus, I think that's important. Like dialogue is important and we're still very early and I think that like that's really important to, to be having right now.